much for coming. Uh, I'm James, obviously. And uh, this is my, I think I've been to every research ed conference so far. I'm like a, you know, I should get a loyalty card or something. And this is the, the fourth one that I've spoken at. And, uh, and I've been, I'm really just, I love this conference. It's such a fascinating mess in a weird way, you know. It's the, the, like right from the very outset, um, when Ben Goldacre kicked off the first ever, ever talk where he was saying basically like education needs to get his house in order and do loads of RCTs and what medicine did and we'll, we'll sort it all out once and for all, you know. And then the next talk I went to was by Frank Ferrady where he said that's all a load of rubbish and you can't do that because social reality is really complicated and we should do what like Aristotle, Aristotle called phrenesis, right? Like professional judgment and wisdom and all that stuff. And I just thought this is fascinating and so this, this sort of tension that exists within this this conference, this movement, if you want to call it that, is just fascinating. And uh, and I find myself as sort of like slightly on the edge of it, I think. I've, I've got a number of, of concerns about it, uh, different concerns that are the ones that, that I've seen elsewhere. And there's three three fundamental ones, really. It's basically everything, <laughs> everything about it. One being the word research, I think, is maybe the wrong place to focus. And I say that as an education researcher. Uh, one being this this uh, this phrase, working out what works, I think is uh, a very problematic phrase. And uh, looking at that picture, it almost looks like she's sort of the, the smile is sort of slipping from her face as she realises that actually that's a, a sort of a false edifice. And and uh, and then thirdly, this the, the microscope, you know, the, this use of a microscope to suggest like, what does that suggest? It's science, right? Well, and so that's why I've got this picture of of the Martian there. What's the, what's the famous line from that film that he says that he's going to do? Anyone seen it? Yeah, happy eyes. Okay. I assume that this would be the cause. He says that, uh, he finds out that, if you've not seen it, he goes to Mars, all the other astronauts bugger off back to Earth and he's left there by himself and he realises that he's basically going to die unless he can figure it out. He says, I'm going to have to science the shit out of it. And that's, that, was his, that was his strategy. And, he, and actually, he literally did that because he grew potatoes out of the other people's poo, didn't he? Anyway, so, um, and that's what I thought when I got into, when I used to work as a scientist in like 10 years ago or so, when I first got into education research, I, came, I had exactly that attitude. I was like, we're just going to science the shit out of this. We'll sort it out once and for all. We'll all be done, you know, we can all go to and, and it took me about five years to realize that you, it's really, you can't really do that. Like natural science and social science are very, very different. It's far more complicated than all of the things that we just heard about in the last uh, in the last talk, it's really, really hard. So this idea, it's just the language of science, which in itself is complicated because this, this talk uses science. So I'm going to talk about this emerging field of implementation science, this, uh, this sort of new field that's sprung up in the last sort of 10 or 15 years or so. Um, and it's very early days, but it's this, this effort to try to figure out how to take what we know about what works or what has worked and not worked so well in other in previous circumstances and how to translate that into social practices and social policies that can replicate and improve on those findings when we implement them at scale. And it's really hard, like it's really, really hard, um, as I will explain. So the first thing to say is ch like change is bloody hard, isn't it? Like just on an individual level, so it's, you know, everybody recognizes this, don't they? It's just, it's so hard to, and you, you're, there's only one of you and you're, we're at least apparently in control of ourselves. Uh, but it's really hard to just change even the slightest thing in a, in a sustained way. You know, you can, you can do stuff, you have a flurry of activity. I read, I read some uh, report recently that said that something like one in four people in this country only know how to cook three meals. And, uh, and, six, and, and those three meals were uh, beans on toast, spaghetti bolognese, so it's quite a leap from there today, isn't it? And, um, Sausage and mash, right? They're, they're, the, they're the big three. And I'm not in that camp, but there's also the, apparently 60% of people just basically eat the same seven meals every week and they just go around and around and around. And I'm pretty much in that camp. And I, I've tried to change that aspect of my life, and God knows how many cookbooks we've got, but you, it's just it's really hard. I don't know why, but just individual change is hard, isn't it? Like, we all know this. And so, if you think about like that, how hard it is to do one like think of, this is this is this is the staff of a local school to me. I know quite a few of these people, and uh, it's, uh, if you think about what have you got there, you've got like a hundred plus people, and who is the in this picture or in any in any staff room? You've got 
you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, you know, trainees and NQTs and maybe even RQTs, and you've got like, you know, people who've sort of been in, in it for about three years, but maybe they're sort of starting to plateau a bit and they're not really, you know, developing stuff so much anymore. You've got people who are part-time, people who work like 70 hours a week. You've got people who are really in it for their subject. You know, they just want to impart science or history or music or drama or whatever it is, and that's their thing. And then you've got people who are really in it for like, or the reason for like human development, they want the kids to, to find their voice, we just heard a talk about oracy, to find who they are, to become more fully themselves, to develop self-knowledge and resilience and strength and all of that stuff, interpersonal skills. So you've got, you've got really ambitious people who are really just like you know, wanting to get to the next level. You've got people who have seen every policy initiative come and go and they sort of just groan inwardly when the next one comes along because they know where it's going in two years' time and they just sort of silently daydream about early retirement and how awesome their allotment is gonna be. So you've got this really, really diverse group of people. I and mean, if it's hard enough to get yourself, who you're apparently in control of, to change something small like how you eat, how on earth are you supposed to implement change on such a massive scale as a single school? Like, it's really hard. And, if you, and that's only the teachers. If you think about the stuff that sits behind them, Think about the factors that might influence the extent to which a given teaching method might work or not work in any given lesson. I'm not going to go through all of this because this, uh, this was, I just came up with this last night. This is just like an initial stab at, at the, the logistics, the, the room, like the fact that this room's got this weird noise at the back it might really freak some kids out. The weather we know can, can affect the, the mood and how receptive kids are. Uh, the students themselves, like how well do they know each other? What are the demographics, the micro-politics? Has there been any beef between them at lunchtime that you don't know about? The stuff that's often invisible to us, but that really governs how kids, the emotional climate of the classroom and so on. There's so many factors. The problem is, is significant. So, a little thought experiment. Imagine that you're the person who was sitting at the front row of that, that group of teachers. You know, you're a head teacher, senior leader. You come to this conference and you, see, you find some nugget some little slice of, of practice, the, the thing, method du jour. Like, what's a fashionable thing at the moment? Interleaving. There you go, interleaving. So you think, right, interleaving. I'm gonna, or maybe, if it's, interleaving is maybe, okay, let's call it interleaving, right? So you, we're gonna get everybody doing that. How, what do you do? Where do you start? I know what a lot of head teachers Go on. Give it to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fling it on an assistant. Yeah. Okay. So you, so you, so so you're the assistant head. You've been told to do this. What do you do? What's the next step? Where do you, you start? Need, you need a smaller pilot group. Oh. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. To, to start experimenting with it and doing it. Yeah. yeah that would be a sensible thing. You sometimes see that happening, don't you? Yeah. You research it more yourself. Do some more research. I was going to say understand a bit more why. Yeah, and where do you sell it? How do you sell it? Let's say you do the research, you've done some pilot work, everyone's on board, what do you do? HOD. Heads of department. Okay. Oh, you're not saying that answer that at once. Yeah. Tell me yes. all. Get everybody together and tell them. And there you go, you get everyone together, don't you, in a twilight and tell them. You just get them all in the same room at the same time and just go, whoa, we're all doing interleaving and you talk about the research and all that stuff. There you go. And so here's the thing, this is this is blows my mind this. I'm gonna play you a clip. This is this guy Thomas Gusky who talks about um, about these different levels of evaluation that you have to do when you when you are um, implementing change. So this is about a five minute clip, but every time I hear it, I just get more and more out of it. So it's really worth thinking about. Well, Cindy, in my presentation this morning, I described how there are five levels of information that you want to gather regarding professional development. The first level, and what we do the best, and in which we have the greatest experience, is participants' reactions to that professional development program. Uh, we'll ask questions like, did you like it? Was your time well spent? Was the information meaningful? Was the presenter credible? Uh, even to, was the room the right temperature? Were the chairs comfortable? Were the refreshment expression tasty? Now, although many people discourage that level of evaluation and say that it's only providing a happiness quotient about whether people enjoyed the experience. I disagree. I believe that it's very important to have that information in professional development deal with some basic human needs and those need to be addressed. A bit more sophisticated would be level two where you looked at participant learning. At this level, you ask, did they learn anything from that experience and have you evidence to show that 
as a result of that experience that people's knowledge base changed, that they know things now they did not know before, or they're able to do things now they were unable to do before. Beyond level two, level three looks apart from the individuals to the organization, and this level deals with organization support and change. What we've discovered is that often we do everything right from a professional development or training perspective, but then send people back into organizations that are not set up to support them to do the things that we have asked them to do. Sometimes this organization support can take the form of additional time, resources, technology support, things like that. But oftentimes things break down because the organization is not set up to support the teachers and what we're asking them to accomplish. Beyond that, level four looks at actual implementation. And so level four, you gather the information to find out whether practice has changed. Did people actually use the new knowledge and skill that they gained? And so here you deal with the criteria by which that effective practice would be seen and, and noted so that you can help the people that aren't implementing become more like those who are implementing and implementing it well. And finally, then you, you look at level five, which asks, was there any impact on students? Have you evidence to show that as a result of this professional development experience that student learning has improved, that more students are accomplishing the things that the school is setting up to have them accomplish? And so what I tried to stress this morning are three basic understandings with regard to these five levels. The first being that every one of the levels is important, that people really have to pay attention to each of these five levels. And each level implies a different kind of information, that it's really important to gather this information because it informs not only what you've done well, but where you want to focus improvement efforts. Second, that each of these levels builds on those that come before. So the middle level can be neglected that people really do have to have a positive reaction to the experience before they can learn anything. They have to learn some things before you can ask for support in the part of the organization. The organization support has to be in place before you get high quality implementation. And certainly you have to have high quality implementation before you can see results in terms of students. And one of the dilemmas that we face in area professional development is often legislators or policymakers are not cognizant of the complexities of this process. They're pressing for level five, but not realizing how things can break down at many points along the way. The last issue that I wanted people to, to really attend to is that if they want to get to level five, the key element in planning is that you need to reverse these levels in the planning process. The first issue that you face in planning professional development is what impact you want to have on students. You have to make sure that that's clear. You have to make decisions about what it is you want to accomplish there and what evidence you should trust to verify that you have. Then you take a step back and say, well, if that's what we want to accomplish with regard to our students, then what are the practices we need to see implemented in order to gain those goals or meet those objectives? Then you take another step back and say, well, if these are the practices that we believe and have evidence to support will lead to those, what's the organization have to do to support that? What time do people need? What resources? What levels of technology are important for them to have? You take another step back and you say, well, if we want that, uh, we have that organization support, then what knowledge do people have to have? What skills do they have to develop? And finally, you consider what professional development experience you can plan to provide people with that knowledge and skill. There you go. I really do get more out of it every time I listen to that, and I use it a lot. Um, it's fascinating, isn't it? Just like, it's when you break it down, people just like, I think so often just skip from one to five and they just think, oh, well, I'll, I'll tell people the thing and then everyone will know about it and then it will just happen. And there's just so many, well, this is crazy, there's so many way, like, levels on which you can break down along the way. Um, but, it, but also, so that, that points out the problem, but also it starts to point to solutions, doesn't it? That if you, if you pay attention to these things, then you can overcome these problems. Just to give you a sense of the scale of the challenge, there's a famous finding from the, from the medical literature. Implementation science is much more developed in the medical world than it is in education. Um, they, there was this famous study, a few studies, that found that um, of well-researched innovations, only 14% of them are used in practice, and it takes 17 years to get even to that point, which is pretty bleak, isn't it? Like, like that's the, 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 Because of all this complexity, and that's in health where I think it's arguably more straightforward to, to, to be like evidence-based than it is in education. Um, so that's what, that's what we're up against. So I'm going to briefly talk about why research, I don't think, is the, is the 
place to, to focus, although I'm not saying that we should stop doing it or stop paying attention to it, but I just think that it's not the, it's not the answer to this problem. Uh, and I'm going to talk about three things. The, the mountain of research and yet the cupboard is bare, McIntyre's gap, and the feedback conundrum. So the mountain of research, does anybody know like how many education research papers are published a year? Ten thousand. Yeah, it's hard to. It's actually quite hard to find out. I couldn't. I couldn't find out. So I asked Quora. You know, the, the amazing website Quora. So I asked, and somebody <laughs> answered. A few people answered. But well, th this was the best one. Uh, this person said that um, there's all different kinds of literature. There's grey literature. So there's like peer-reviewed literature, and then grey literature, like institute reports and so on. But this thing, education source, which I have to take her word for it because you, you need credentials to log into it, and I couldn't get it. But she says that in 2017, this avoids the grey literature, so this is apparently just the, the you know, a, a conservative number, 200,000 articles a year. She said, what, isn't it? And, then, so, and if, if, if the average pile is 20, if the average piece is 20 pages thick, I did a bit of maths, and that's two shards worth <laughs> a, a year, just stacked up. Two shards, more than two shards worth a year. That famous unit of, of research, <laughs> um, which is a lot, isn't it? And yet, you know, when I was I was listening to there's a good there's an interesting you know the test podagogy the pet podcasting there's one with Dylan Williams that I listened to, and he's saying that actually quite often when you really need to find something like you find that the cupboard is bare. Like, well, what's going on? Like how can how can those two things be true? How can we be publishing two shards of of paper on on stuff every year, and yet when you really want to find something out, you find that actually. The answers aren't there. Like, there's something we're going on. And that's partly because of part two, which is um, what I refer to as McIntyre. So this is based on so Donald McIntyre. I've called it that. He, it's probably pre-existed him, but he wrote about it really well, um, where he said that the just the, the part of the problem is just that the kinds of research, the kinds of knowledge that researchers create, is not the same kind of knowledge that practitioners need. And even when it is. Like then there's a problem because of all that stuff that we talked about before, the, 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 the contextual differences from one place to the next, what works in one place isn't going to work somewhere else, and we need to somehow take account of that. And then uh, the third thing is this, this problem, the feedback conundrum, or that feeling when you do what works and make things work. So, so feedback, as everybody is probably aware in this room, is like considered you know, by Hattie and by the EEF to be like, this is the most, the most effective thing. The EEF toolkit tells it gives us high impact for very low cost, which sounds amazing, doesn't it? Like, what's not to like about that? High impact, low cost. Well, there's a few things to not like about it. One being that it leads to things like triple marking because there's some, some senior leaders go away and they read a finding like this and they go, right, we just need to do more feedback than we've ever given. We'll mark every single piece of work within an inch of its life and then we'll get the kids to respond to that feedback and we'll mark their responses. And, and it's really problematic. Like teachers leave the profession in their droves because of the, the market workload. Uh, but even more concerning than that, I would argue, is this. So this is this is a a, a graph that's quite often cited, increasingly frequently cited, from a paper that was 20 years ago that looked at over 600 different feedback interventions that were done in schools. They looked at the effect sizes and they just plotted the distribution of effect sizes on a graph. And like most things, it made forms bell curve, right? And the, because the bell curve is, the, 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 zero, the, the blue line is zero, and so because the bell curve is shifted slightly to the right of, of, the, of the midpoint of zero, it's true to say that on average, a feedback intervention will give you a bump in the right direction. But, in, and it tails off to some really, really effective stuff that had some crazy effect sizes up here. But you can see where this is going. In 38% of the, of the cases, I think it was, 230 of these interventions, had a negative effect size. Like it made things worse than if you'd done nothing at all. And if you oh, done, sorry, if you'd done business as usual. And so that I just think that we, it's such an important thing to grasp. That like if you're a senior leader, you read this. The thing that the EEF tells us is the most effective thing. You stand at the front of a, of a hall full of teachers and say, right, everyone, we're going to do this new thing. It's evidence based. There is about a one in three chance we're going to make things worse. Who's with me? You know, that's they're not going to get very much support for that intervention, are they? And yet, that is what they're saying, even if they don't realise that they're saying it. And this, you know, because unless you are, 
unless you've been much more sophisticated, the previous speaker was just talking about how we need to really critically engage with research and think about the, the context in which that was done and the context in which we work and to what extent they overlap, and it's a complicated, messy thing. Uh, but if we're, not, if we're not doing that work for ourselves within schools, like, we've got no way of knowing where on the bell curve we sit with regard to any aspect of, of school life if we're making things better or worse. And that's not a nice feeling. Which brings me to this, the invisible truth that lurks behind the EEF toolkit, um, which is, this is my fancy bit of animation, are you ready? There you go. See? So it's people, isn't it? Like, they, what is this? Like, feedback, metacognition, mastery, collaboration, tuition, phonics, like, digital tech. These are all, like, disembodied, just, like, abstract things, aren't they? But, like, the, pe the, the, the reason that these things work or don't work is not, not only down to the, to the idea, it's down to the people who were behind it, the people who really, really made things Made it, made it work, who believed in it, whose, whose values were aligned with it, and who actually made it work, you know. And that's a really, really important point. My, own, my PhD was a, a study about um, a learning to learn intervention, and the people, we had a selective, uh, competitive selection process for the people who were appointed to that team. And we, so everyone was really, really up for it, and we all used to go around to each other's houses, and we were planning lessons together, and we all were really, really keen on it, and, and it had a positive impact, and data came up, it looked like we had a significant impact. And some people criticised it by saying, but that's because you were already up for it. Like, it's not the idea, it's the people. Like, make it work with a bunch of jaded old cynics, and then I'll believe that it works, you know? And that's, just, like, that's crazy, isn't it? So we need to factor in the people, and that's not something that is often done. Um, and th so I went to, there was, a, there was this conference I went to a few years ago, it was called Implementing Implementation Science. And I went to it completely cold, and didn't know what it was. And there was just this phrase just, leapt out at it and that just hit me like a, like a church bell. It was boom! The practitioner is the intervention. Like it's really, really about people making, making positive changes in schools. And it's not just about interleaving. It's about like getting loads of people to be really, really excited about interleaving. And starting with make, choosing the pilot people really, really carefully and thinking about how you go to phase two and phase three and so on, building capacity. And that's where implementation science enters the field. So thinking back to that, that um, finding before, for the, uh, studies of, of, of what, what sorts of implementation we find when we put an implementation team in place, we go from that finding that we talked about before, it's like it takes 17 years to get 14% coverage. Implementation teams, uh, we're looking at an insane change, right? 80% coverage within three years, and you follow the, um, the references to that. Um, so I'm going to talk about three examples of, of implementation science frameworks. But before I do, just a quick word about language. Like it's a proper word swap, and just a little health warning. Like it's really dry. Like the, the language just is painful. And so there's, there's all this. Yeah. So so this is uh, there was a study that, that looked at health articles, two and a half uh, thousand health articles, and they found over a hundred terms that were used to describe basically the same thing. Um, but the most common use in the UK, we most commonly most commonly hear knowledge mobilisation. In the US, they talk about knowledge translation. Uh, but just one key distinction: so knowledge mobilisation, which you often hear about people talking about, especially in, in unis, uh, is a wide range of activities uh, to increase the impact of research on policy, and that can include things like what we're doing here today, publications, uh, institutions like the Chartered College, or you know like. Higher, higher education institutions, programs, and it includes implementation science. So implementation science is like a subset of that, and that's a set of frameworks and strategies that are designed to quite carefully promote the adoption, adaption as well, and integration of evidence-informed interventions to change practices in, in specific settings. So it's much more focused, much more sort of laser focused. So I want to look at three examples. There's uh, the EEF guidance on implementation, which was published, was it last year? I think it was maybe last year. Um, there's something, again, held like core, core intervention components, which is a beautiful title. So Blaise et al. 
uh, you just think of it as like a recipe for successful intervention, implementation, right? Just think of it as a human name. And another one which is a, a, a frightful, so the C, C band, kabam, hall and hoard are great, it's really, really good, but again, some of the language is terrific. Uh, Concerns-based adoption model is something that I've been using with schools uh, recently and it's, it's really useful. So the EEF guidance on implementation uh, is, is well worth a read. If you haven't seen it already, it's really good. Um, I was talking to uh, Jonathan Sharples recently, who was I think, probably the driving force behind this, and um, he's really, really sort of excited about it. They've, they've you know, sent out about 10,000 copies of this, but he's also quite sort of circumspect and saying that this is a first stab. If you read the, in the guidance itself, it sort of says, you know, this, we're not saying anything new here, we just gathered a whole bunch of stuff together, and this is an emerging field, it's a rapidly changing field. We're not saying this is the definitive recipe for success. Um, and you know, some people have, have criticized it on the basis that it's quite focused on fidelity. It's like just like just sort of like whipping everybody into line and just getting everybody doing the same thing at the same time, sort of thing. And that's one way of viewing implementation, but there are other people who take a different view that it's you need to maybe find ways to harness the agency of the individual people for them to implement the best version of themselves rather than everybody just sort of towing the line in this top-down way. Uh, but the EF are keen to develop this and, and uh, I think 2.0 is, is going to come out down the line. The second one is uh, this Blaze one, the recipe for successful implementation, and it's just when, they, when, when you look at that Benguski pyramid that we saw earlier, or if you look at this, it's just it's really common sense stuff. It's just like breaking things down into bite-sized chunks. The first one being about, like, just think about the people. Think about the attitudes, beliefs, values, and the theoretical understanding and acceptance of the people who deliver the intervention. So like, really start by understanding those people in that staff room and being careful about how you select. Well, there was a really nice project, the, the RLC, the Research Learning Communities project that the, the, uh, the EF ran with UCL. Chris Brown was, was the person who was heading it. And they used to do this really nice thing where they would, they would get the, all the teachers to fill out a questionnaire. And it was like about the other teachers, and it was like, who's influential? Who, who do people listen to? Who, who's like a, a mover and a shaker, or a decision, what do you call it, an influencer, that sort of thing. And, and those people are sometimes people in positions of leadership, or it's sometimes just like a classroom level teacher. And then they would target those people and say, would you like to be in this, in this thing? So that they would go into it in a much smarter way than just doing it in this typical top-down way. So think about creating an implementation team, and, and um, you sometimes see people talking about like a vertical slice. So they get a bunch of stakeholders from all different levels, from the LSAs, SENCOs, governors, senior leaders, middle leaders, classroom teachers, everybody who's like looking at this from all different levels of the organization. So that it's not just like this sort of like biased little thing that's just been sort of popped off in one little pocket, but you're looking at whole, whole school implementation. That stuff that Gusky was talking about, get the systems in place, the technology, the organizational systems, uh, finance, HR, just make sure that that stuff's in place, because how often do you hear about things? You, there's some project, it's going really well, and then the money just dies in like April, and then the, the project dies with it. And you're like, oh, come on, like, that's ridiculous. Um, clear leadership and ongoing support, so that it isn't just like, who was saying that delegated to somebody else before, but it's actually, it's really important that the leadership give like repeated messages about the importance of whatever it is that you're trying to implement. Provide, this is a good one, provide in-depth training on the theory and the evidence behind it. So rather than just, and, and that's in-depth, so that's not just like a slide to show a graph to say, look, interleaving gives you a bump, let's all go for it. It's like really think about like what interleaving is, get into the cognitive science of it, why is it that we're doing this thing? Um, ongoing support, actively monitoring how things are going and planning the evaluation like at all of those levels that Gusky was talking about before and planning that right from the outset is really key and I've really sort of shifted my view in the recent years I've basically been an evaluation guy I've been just like really into this idea of teachers doing sort of action research as, as, a, as a part of as a part of what we do but I've found that increasingly you do an action research project at the end, and at the end, the teacher says, oh, well, my conclusion is, if I'd have implemented the thing probably in the first place, then I probably would have got good data, but I didn't, and that was my finding. So, oh, okay. So we need to start seeing this in two cycles. So the ones that I'm doing this year, we're doing it in two cycles. So the first cycle is like outward looking, just look what's going on and collect some baseline data, just to just form a rich picture about what's going on now. 
and then really carefully think about, you know, do some reading and think about what it is that we're going to implement and then implement it really carefully and only then start to think about those evaluative questions about like to what extent does X impact on Y. And so I have to, I'm, I'm hopeful that that's gonna um, <coughs> make more of a difference. Um, and this is, this is an interesting thing. I don't know if you've come across this before. Have you seen this diffusion of innovation? This idea that you, you get those, those innovators, that, that survey type approach that I just mentioned that Chris Brown uses, get the people who are like gonna be really, really keen get them on board first of all, but also have a plan for then like how you move from this phase to the early adopters. And around here, this is where you often see an arrow and diagrams like this that say like this is a tipping point, you know? And this is the and when it tips it just goes woof and you get everybody's everybody's down with it. But um and, and so that one of the things that I work on a lot is oracy, which the, the previous talk was on. And oracy this has, has sort of been it's just been ebbing and flowing. The word was invented like over fifty years ago. And still, like lots of people, don't know what it means, um, and it's because it's just for a whole range of complicated reasons. It's sort of been ebbing and flowing up here. The innovators have been on board, and the um, and early adopters have been on board, but it hasn't quite tipped. It just hasn't quite got there. But it looks like I've put my money where my mouth is. I really think that it is going to. This is, you can sense this real groundswell with Oracy, and it's just they've just set up a all-party parliamentary committee to look at it. So it's sort of it really has seems to have come from the bottom and from all angles, and it seems I, I, it feels like oracy is going to become bread and butter issue, like literacy and numeracy is in the next five to ten years. I would hazard a guess. And then the third one, have we got till half past? I'm going to do that. The third one is the yeah, whole and whole the concerns based adoption model, which has been used for fifty years or so, forty years very widely used uh, in businesses as well as in schools. It's from the states. Uh, and it provides a framework for bridging what they refer to as the implementation gap between where you are now and where you want to be uh, along three dimensions. And so there's the stages of concern, levels of use, and the third one, which can cause drowsiness, innovation configurations. I nearly lost a whole, a whole room of primary school teachers last year. So it was just like, they were like, whoa, stop, just stop. We need some time. I was like, honestly, bear with me. You will understand this by the end. And they did, but they did. Yeah, if you're going to talk about this, like, just shows up the language a bit, because it, it is a problem. Um, <clears throat> so stages of concern, this is really nice. So you just like, what, let's the interleaving, let's take your example. To what extent are your colleagues concerned with this? And like the colleagues that you, that you are concerned with, to what extent are they concerned with the thing? And so the, the, here we have zero, I am not concerned about it. Like this blissful ignorance, right? It's hard, oh, I've never heard of God interleaving and it's fine. And then you go, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. I'd like to know more about it. And, and you go through different stages. So there's, like, there's, there's concerns that are to do with the self. Uh, I, I want to know more about it, but also like, how will this affect me? Like, do, what, do I have to, start chopping and changing, how, how am I going to deal with this? And then you move to concerns about the task, like I seem to be spending all my time into leaving my lessons around and it's just difficult to keep track of where I am and so on. And then you get through that stage and you get to, to concern about the impact that this thing is having. How is this use affecting the learners? How can I refine it? How can I relate what I'm doing to what others are doing? And then the, the sort of metacognitive phase, if you like, where you're refocusing it and you're thinking, Okay, I've, I've got that, and I think that we can do it even better in the future. So that's stages of concern. Levels of use, I won't run through all these, it's pretty straightforward. It's just like ranges from not using it at all to like cooking on gas, and there's a whole range of things. So it's a really useful thing to just get your colleagues to, to look at these scales. We do this as, as an activity at different points throughout the year. It's like, where are you now? And it's okay to be here, like it's not, there's no judgment attached to any of this. And where, where do you think you will realistically be by December, by Easter, by 2020, you know, like, and, because it's going to be different for different people. Um, and that's an important thing to realize that, that, you know, everyone moves at different paces, don't they? And likewise with levels of use, because you can be, you know, you can be concerned about something and be aware of it, but actually not using it yet. You just sort of, it's like at the back of your mind. And then this one, I'll put a little kitten on there just to brighten up the slides. Uh, this, is, this is a really important one. So this is like, you think you call it something like steps to success or something like that. And so you start with, so this is, 
uh, an example that I took from the internet, which is about a, a teacher who's wanting to go more in, like, down the route of dialogic teaching. Right? So they're wanting, wanting to get the kids talking to each other. I might get dragged off by security at the moment. It's not about direct instruction. So uh, <laughs> this is where you start, right? So you start by saying that the teachers, the sole questionnaire, they're asking short questions. Like they're not giving wait time and stuff. It's just like it's a really basic level of practice. But that's not a dialogic classroom. And then you start with the end in mind, and you go, right, what will cooking on gas look like? And you flesh that out. So the, the opposing questions that elicit engagement challenge the students' thinking. You provoke students to think and reason together. You're getting them to ask questions of one another, and, and you scaffold that so that you can withdraw, withdraw the teacher's direction of that over time, and so on. And then you go, right, what's the midpoint? What's the halfway look like between here and there? And you go, oh, OK. So you start to flesh that out. And then, if you can, you can fill these two out, which is where you get really into the nuances of teaching and learning. And it's a really, really useful, useful thing so that you can have a framework, a really practical framework that people that come up with themselves that they've got some ownership over, that they can say, yeah, OK, this is where I am, and I understand what the next step looks like. And everybody's gone through this process together. Uh, and so what Hall and Horde say is that these are like the three planks, if you like, of the implementation bridge. So as you move along, move up that scale of stages of concern so that people are, you know, concerned to the appropriate level, they're using it to a level which is, you know, effective and constant and sustainable and so on. And that innovation configuration, they're moving up to levels four and five of that. And that, that's how you make that gap. And you do it step by step along each of those three dimensions. It's a really, really useful model. And there's also, if you're not a bridge person, there's an implementation mega pyramid Venn diagram thing as well, which just, you know, same, same thing, but in a different format. So to finish, um, like research, I'm not dissing it, right? Obviously, it's really, really important that we, that we find out what's been going on elsewhere. And because it, it can help set a vision, can't it? It sets it you the vision. I've seen research about interleaving and, and vision. And vision's a really, really important aspect of leadership. But as Edison probably didn't say, because like internet quotes are never what they seem, are they? Vision without execution is just hallucination. Or to bring this. To, whoever said it, yeah, exactly. Uh, to bring it full, back to uh, Matt Damon. Implementation. <laughs> and so, um, next steps. There's a few things that you can do if you're interested in taking this further. Number one, I work, so I work at the IOE for the London Centre for Leadership in Learning, so this is, I'm afraid it's for London-based people. Um, we're planning on from running a programme uh, from next September to help schools to get their heads around all of this stuff, to form an implementation team, to meet with them, like say, six times throughout the year, to look at some avenue of practice that they're going to develop and implement change in over, say, two to three years. If you're interested in that, we're going to, we're going to, do, we're going to pilot it at one local school from January to June so we can get our head around what it is what it looks like and cut our teeth on it. But if you're interested in doing a program like that, um, drop me a line, my email is there, j.manian at UCL. Check out, there's actually quite a lot of implementation science videos on YouTube that are largely health-based, but there's some educational stuff. And again, they're fairly dry, but I, I find this stuff really interesting. You know, like it's, yeah, I just do, I don't know why. Um, there's a thing called the Active Implementation Hub, which is US-based. But it's just like a really, it's quite overwhelming actually. There's so many resources that they've accrued on there that it's sort of a bit like dizzying. Um, but there, there's, some, there's lots of really good stuff on there. And as I was talking with Jonathan Sharples recently, that stuff is like maybe not as evidence informed as it seems. Like it's all sort of like, it looks logical, but there's, the, the evidence base, this is a new field, it's an emerging field. There's also a UK version, the UK Implementation Society, check out their website. There's a really good, Gagliardi et al. did a really, really nice, they've got a mega long checklist so that you can sort of, you can create your own checklist from this mega thing and it's all backed by, by published research. So have a look at that if you just type in Gagliardi uh, evidence informed implementation checklist. The EF guidance is great. Paul and Horde have been going for years, but they, they put, put a book out just a couple of years ago which is useful. And just generally, I just think that we should collectively just start looking beyond like what has worked elsewhere and just start taking into account these common sense principles of how to implement effective change in our context. And that's the end of that. Thank you.